Good afternoon. I'm Christina Elson, the Executive Director of the Center for the Study of Capitalism at Wake Forest University. Thank you for joining us today for our discussion on revolutionizing litigation finance. This panel is part of a series on the future of capitalism. If you'd like to learn more about this series, please go to capitalism.wfu.edu to find more information and you'll also find links to join our social media community. Nearly 20 years ago, the first litigation funding concept was developed as a way to capitalize litigation. It was first embraced by plaintiff law firms who are dependent largely upon often long delayed contingency fees. Despite opposition from some business groups, the trend has grown astronomically to the point where many large law firms have developed their own funds. There are so many litigation funders now that the market has grown to a point where money is chasing litigation. So where will this all end and what does it all mean? Well, to answer this question, as always, I am joined by Richard Levick, Chairman and CEO of Levick, and the Executive Affiliate with the Center, who will join me to lead, lead this illustrious panel. Richard, welcome. Christina, thank you so much. And it's always so nice to be introduced only after the part where you say impossible question. Now Richard's here to help us answer. So thank <laughs> you. You know, I really appreciate that. Let, let me introduce uh, this illustrious panel. And it, it really is. Uh, we have all these leaders in the industry. So first, uh, Rebecca Barabee, who is the CEO and founder of Avenue 33, a litigation finance consultancy. Rebecca, great to see you uh, and welcome to the program. Program. Uh, also with us, Andrew Cohen, who's a director at Burford, the leader uh, in the industry, and I think an innovator and revolutionary. Andrew, great to see Thanks. you. Tim Scranton, uh, who is the who is really just one of the founders of the entire industry and a founder and managing director of uh, Legis Finance. Tim, as always, great to see you and welcome to the program. Leslie uh, Perrin, who is chairman of the, uh, the association that uh, is in charge of the new association, the International uh, Legal Financial Association, and also the chairman of Colonius Capital. Leslie, welcome to the program. And uh, Edward Truant, who is the CEO of Slingshot Capital. Ed, uh, great to see you. Although I know with some of our technical problems, I'm seeing a very still you, but I'm trusting that by audio you are there. I am here. Great to see you. So let's open this up. Tim, I mentioned in the opening, you are a founding father, if not the founding father of the industry. Why don't you give us a little background? You know, I've heard the story before, uh, you know, about your father and your concept. Uh, and I think sharing that would be just uh, terrific. Well, I'm not going to talk about my father, <clears throat> because the last time we did, uh, it, it got me into trouble. But uh, still getting scolded at this age, it's a good thing to see that, that we're never too old to sent to our room. I'm glad he still got his wits about him. Um, uh, well, you know, looking at the industry rather than my personal experience, um, as I like to t tell my English friends, particularly um, years ago, um, litigation finance goes back a um, uh, hundred years or more in the US uh, through contingent fees. Uh, this is something Christina touched on, but um, you know it's pretty normal in the US uh, to think of the notion of uh, people investing in litigation. Um, that of course continues today, they still do. Um, and and I might, I'd like to debate at some point uh, whether litigation finance is really, uh, is really replacing or supplementing uh, that on a, on a wide scale, because it's, uh, it's true in some respects and it's uh, not true in others. But uh, that's, that's really the genesis of this. I didn't come up with the idea, um, um, but I did perhaps make a, a pivot um, uh, based largely on an English experience I was having at the time uh, where England passed a law that uh, not only permitted, but actually encouraged litigation finance. 
Now, if you look at why they did that, um, it's, it was not uh, focused on people um, uh, in the business that we are in, and I refer to we as the panel members here. It was really focused more on access to justice, uh, helping the impecunious uh, find a way to, to hire a lawyer for, for a cause. Uh, because in England, they didn't have contingent fees. In fact, something to unpack at another time uh, is the fact that contingent fees were actually illegal uh, in, in England back then. Uh, the thought being, who, who would you trust um, less than a lawyer uh, to, to make an investment in a case? Uh, obviously, the polar opposite in the U.S., uh, but England did pass this law, and that was uh, sort of a springboard, if you will, to uh, the notion that outside capital can invest not just in the uh, litigations of the uh, impecunious, uh, people who can't afford a lawyer, but rather uh, there was an investment opportunity. And maybe that's really the segue to this, this panel. Um, I think most of us, by the way, are focused on what I would call commercial litigation finance, right? Um, there is an entire industry that actually predates the, uh, the 20 year uh, mark that Christina referred to, and that is finan financing of consumer claims, uh, even in the United States, uh, whether they were through payday loans or advances to law firms or what have you. But, but that, uh, that sector uh, is, is focused more on what I'll call the consumer side. This panel and what I do uh, um, specifically is focused on commercial uh, litigation finance, larger investments, larger law firms, larger cases, uh, not consumer cases. Um, and um, that's an important uh, point. Maybe if the audience is interested, they can go back and look at a, a RAND report uh, that was done in uh, 2009 uh, on alternative litigation finance because it makes these distinctions very carefully uh, between consumer and, and commercial. Uh, my, my own experience was, um, <clears throat> it was to launch a, a firm called Juridica, uh, which uh, was listed on the London Stock Exchange in 2007. I'm happy to say that it was the, uh, uh, the last um, uh, IPO that went on <laughs> on the London Stock Exchange uh, for quite some time thereafter. Uh, that was the beginning of the financial meltdown. And so we're, we're lucky to be here. Had we been a little later, I don't know where this panel would be now, uh, but the market smiled on us, I suppose. Uh, Juridica uh, was less successful in what it did. Uh, and of course, and independently, uh, there, there were people like Leslie on our panel with Kalenius that you know, saw the same opportunity um, and launched his firm. Obviously, Burford that uh, Andrew is uh, representing uh, launched their firm, which has gone on to be the most successful uh, Juridica has uh, disappeared into the uh, into the fog of history. Uh, I'm sad to say, but, um, um, but but there you have it. So, you know, that's sort of the beginning. That was 2007, 2008. Richard, I don't know if I could add to that. Tim, that that's great. And before Christine, I turned it over to you, Andrew. You look like you were chomping at the bit to share a few thoughts with with some of the things that Tim was sharing. So I thought we turned it over to you. Oh, I, I completely agree uh, with Tim on, on the history of the industry um, and sort of the, the earlier entrance uh, into the market um, and agree, you know, that's that's really where the idea of the commercial litigation finance uh, sector began. Um, and I think uh, since then, um, in the in the dozen or so years since then, um, it's it's sort of grown and, and um, you know, incorporated more of the legal sector than we even thought of. Um, back in at the founding, when we were starting, we were thinking, okay, well, we'll find, you know, big chunky cases that need investment to be successful, um, get better outcomes for usually the plaintiff side, um, and you know, do uh, have a net positive result for everyone involved. Um, you know, since then, we've we've realized that the risk on a single case is really hard to uh, is an expensive risk, um, and so in order to make litigation capital more accessible, um, you know, we've, we've pivoted to portfolio arrangements with multiple cases. We've, we've done much more in the side of uh, law firm investing, um, usually also against uh, a, a portfolio of cases where a risk of a single case is, you know, is high, but, you know, distributed across a portfolio of, of cases, um, you know, it's, it's cheaper for the client and, you know, it's a, it's a less risky proposition for the funder um, and, and it's a more, 
accessible. Um, and, you know, alongside that, as, as uh, firms like uh, Doretica, Colunius, Burford have, have been successful over time, and we've seen a lot more new entrants in the market, um, not so much on the public side, um, but, uh, you know, private capital um, has gotten involved in a big way um, uh, and you know, even, even crowdsourced uh, capital. So, um, you know, especially in, in the past five or six years, you've seen a lot more new entrants, a lot more capital. And I think as Christina alluded to in the beginning, you, you do see much more competition in the market, um, which is, you know, maybe, maybe some of us on this panel are a little you know, frustrated that we actually have to compete for, uh, for cases and when, when maybe there were opportunities that we just sort of could snatch up before. Um, but I think it's a good, um, you know, in terms of you know, capitalism, it's a good uh, development because it means that, uh, you know, there's better price finding um, and there's better, um, you know, pricing of the risk. Um, and that's, that's, that's a net benefit for the entire legal system. So, yeah. Christine. Yeah, Richard, I, I would also add, you know, the, the entire industry almost owes a bit of a, a debt of gratitude to some of the early publicly listed players because, you know, Litigation finance in and of itself, or legal finance more broadly, is, is a pretty opaque um, industry. And by virtue of having publicly listed uh, companies with disclosure requirements, it's allowed a, a great deal of transparency to enter the marketplace, which got investors comfortable with the, the risk reward uh, dynamic and has ultimately resulted in a lot of the private partnerships that Andrew uh, just mentioned. And so uh, I think it's been important to uh, really as an accelerant uh, to the industry uh, to have some of those publicly listed players and get people comfortable with the the risks inherent in the asset class. And so uh, uh, I think that's definitely been a positive and an, an accelerant. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Burford has now listed itself on New York Stock Exchange as of October 19th. Um, and so now we're subject to a new set of uh, disclosure regulations. Um, but I think, you know, again, that that is just increasing the visibility of the litigation funding industry and comfort um, with it as an asset class. Do, do you think in some ways that the opposition, the longstanding opposition by the chamber helped the industry mature more quickly? Maybe Leslie, you want to take that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that um, much of what the chamber has done in relation to legal finance has been uh, useful. Um, other than to try to protect those um, uh, members of the chamber that are so large that they have this inherent advantage as defendants in litigation. And they regard that advantage as their right. Um, and uh, they don't like to have it challenged by some of the people who are here on this panel. And therefore, they, they want to be the source of, of disinformation about litigation funding, about legal finance, which is inherently a commercial activity. It has nothing to do with the consumer side of settlement funding and so on that Tim mentioned in passing. Um, the, 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 the legal finance is best thought of in, in that comparison as investment banking and consumer finance is best thought of as payday loan gaming. So the, the, that's the sort of confusion that the chamber is sowing in people's minds. But what the chamber has to realize is that many, many members of the chamber are using legal finance. Uh, probably more members are using finance than are paying for the Institute of Legal Reform, which is the main instrument through which the chamber sows disinformation about, about uh, legal finance. So I'm, I find it very difficult to be positive about the, um, about the chamber's contribution to legal finance, but I suppose it does um, uh, uh, produce a certain amount of uh, unanimity against them from people like those on this panel. I'd be surprised if anyone wants to speak up in the defense of the chamber today. Re Rebecca, this is uh, brings us to an interesting point um, about the growth and maturity of this market. So this was a new market. Um, you know, Tim, Andrew, Leslie, Edward, they all had uh, interesting entrance into this. And um, 
you noticed as a entrepreneur also that there were some aspects of this market that you could address or solve problems. And so tell us about that, how you did, how you went about doing that. Sure. Thank you, Christina. So I previously to where I am now, I was working at a funder um, who was focused mainly on international arbitration claims. So I should mention just um, in addition to what Andrew said, that the you know, the bigger funds like the Burfords of the world are focused very much on sort of big portfolio cases. There are a variety of smaller funders out there that still, you know, make investments in one-off single cases and also a, a broad swath of types of cases. Um, you know, again, not so much the consumer space that we that Tim had mentioned, but, but in other types of sort of mass tort, um, international arbitration, other arbitration cases. So I, I do want to mention that that is still very much alive um, and well. Um, but I noticed over time working in the industry that, you know, as Edward said, Ed said there are, a, the, the industry is relatively opaque. There are only a couple of a small handful, um, basically Omni and Burford who are listed publicly. And therefore most of the other um, funders out there you know, their information is private and it's hard to kind of navigate and understand, A, who is out there. There's no sort of like general listing. You know, you don't have to, to put your name on a, on a list and say, this is, what, this is what I do. I have this money. Um, so it's hard for people to find sometimes um, the funding. And it's also hard to kind of get a market overview of what terms look like, uh, because this is not standardized in the way that you know, a revolving credit line would be relatively standardized if you go to a bank to get funding for your company. So I saw that there was this need for kind of help for new entrants into the market to kind of figure out what is out there, what are market terms, how can I get financing that works for me to use as a strategy, you know, to, to monetize my risk. And, you know, there are a lot of other tools out there other than just litigation finance. I mean, for example, and Tim knows a lot about this, there, there's a really awesome way to use litigation finance in combination with insurance. So, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of, that's just one of the many possibilities out there. So I decided um, for myself that I was going to try to help fill this hole in the litigation finance market and go out as a consultant, you know, with background and experience, um, you know, dealing very much in the litigation finance world to be available to help litigants, law firms, even funders who are coming in new to the industry, as well as all of the sort of third party players that are popping up like the new insurers, not necessarily new insurers, but insurers creating new products. Um, to relate to this industry or investigative firms who are trying to, you know, help, you know, enforce cases when necessary. There's a whole slew of new entrants that really need some guidance because there is really no central um, place to, to go and understand that. So that's, that's sort of what I am doing. There may be a few others who are doing that too, but in the United States, um, there aren't that many. And so, you know, that is a hole that we're, that I think I'm trying to fill because I think this industry can be successful, can promote justice on sort of a larger scale and also can make money for a lot of, for a lot of investors and companies. So what could, what could be bad? Ed, can you talk a little bit about uh, your fund and some of the issues that you're seeing? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I started uh, with my partners, uh, as far as we can tell, the, the world's uh, first litigation uh, finance fund of funds. So, so we're not a funder per se, but we're rather an investor in a series of funds. And, um, and, and my, my next evolution under Slingshot will be sort of a derivation of that, uh, with really designed to help uh, institutional investors who are perhaps looking at the asset class, considering investing, but are not quite sure how to make that first step. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to create and design a fund that that allows them to, to make that market entrance in a way that's you know relatively low risk. And so you know some of the, the issues that I think about on a pretty regular basis. So I'll, I'll, I'll focus a little bit more on the macro stuff. Is just you know regulatory, political, uh, headline industry risk, 
and how those are manifesting themselves and how they're getting dealt with. So, you know, we, we unfortunately saw uh, what can only be uh, termed an attack by Muddy Waters on Burford, which I think was very successfully uh, countered by, by Burford. Um, in, in Australia, you're seeing some regulation around managed investment schemes for class action opportunities. You're seeing uh, ASIC uh, forcing uh, funders to, uh, uh, to register um, in, in Australia. So, you know, it's becoming a little bit political down there. And I think that's in response to, quite frankly, the success that, that they've seen in the, uh, in the Australian marketplace. Uh, we spoke a little bit about the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I'm very encouraged by the fact that um, the industry's gotten together and, and started the um, International Legal, Legal Finance Association. And so uh, I'm very interested to see what, what Leslie's going to be doing there. And because and, um, uh, I think there's a lot of important work to be done, a lot of issues to be dealt with. Uh, and so it's good to see the, uh, the industry at a very high level pull together and, 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 and uh, put in place something that's truly global in nature, as opposed to being a little bit more uh, focused on a particular geography. Um, the other thing I think about a lot, and I've been uh, uh, doing a little bit of social media on this, is um, the whole concept of litigation finance, specifically commercial litigation finance, as an ESG investing asset class. So that's environmental, social, and governance uh, investing. It, it is uh, to, to you know to refer to it as a wave. I think is is doing a, a disservice. I think it's a tsunami that's coming our way. Uh, in terms of uh, institutional, uh, high net worth, family office, everyone is thinking about beyond uh, returns, which are you know no less important today, perhaps more important today than they were in the past. Um, but you know, what are the other benefits that come can come out of uh, investing? And there's, I think, very few asset classes uh, that are as effective in, in producing environmental, social, and governance change as litigation finance. Um, and you see just a ton of different examples, uh, everything from PFAS uh, to um, uh, that interesting case in Australia called the stolen wages case uh, that benefited their, their local Aboriginal communities. And there's just, you know, time and time again, lots of, even on the commercial side, you know, uh, lots of bad behavior by, by large corporates that are being rectified uh, with the help of litigation finance. And I think it's incumbent upon the industry to get that message out there uh, and position itself as an ESG investing asset class, uh, because I think that's going to be a very attractive uh, uh, for investors. Can, I, can, can yeah, I pick please. up a couple of those things? So, um, the truth is that legal finance is depicted as being bad for business because it's supposedly creating litigation that wouldn't otherwise exist. But in fact, it's good for business because it, it's, it's improving the bloodstream of, of business by making, my, by making a reality out of the rule of law, where sometimes it's a theoretical thing. Now, it's not all about the rule of law. And the rule of law is both a sort of moral concept and, and I think, a capitalist concept, concept recognizing where we are speaking here. Mm -hmm. Because capitalism depends on businesses following the rule of law. And litigation finance, legal finance, is assisting people to do that. Um, the International Legal Finance Association was founded only a couple of months ago. There were six founder members and there have already been eight other members. And I think there may well soon be another eight members. And the, 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 it's a global voice to try to ensure that the messages that are received by the relevant constituencies in the judiciary, in the legislature, in the executive, in marketplaces across the world are the, the right messages. They're the, the messages that are objective and um, are, are not um, simply um, uh, preaching to the converted. And we have four principal geographical spaces because you can talk globally, but it's very difficult to act globally. You have to act locally. So you talk the talk, here I am doing it, but you have to take action um, locally. So we have the US, which 
is a, a, an important, um, the, probably the important place. It's where the, the chamber will f have its last gunfight uh, about legal finance. It'll be here, make no mistake, in the US. There's the UK or England as it's more properly described in legal terms, where there, is, there has been a voluntary regulation system for 10 years and it's working very well and has served its principal function of stopping statutory regulation from taking hold. We're going to have a, a, a theater of operations in, in, in continental Europe uh, where funding has been legal for many, many more decades than, than it has been uh, anywhere else under the civil law system. And then Australia, where, um, as uh, Ed mentioned, there is a parliamentary inquiry, which uh, I'm sure the, the, the US Chamber would deny having any instrumentality in bringing about. But their denials might sound a little hollow were they to be here on this panel making them now. There's a parliamentary inquiry and there are those, those issues that, uh, that Ed mentioned. If they succeed, they will come, they will move a, across the globe, either um, ac across the Pacific to, to the US or across um, to, um, to the UK, across to the other side of the world for them. And uh, at a local level, the International Legal Finance Association will catalyze action by local committees in response to these things. And on a global level, we'll be talking the talk. That's, that's what we, we want to do. And any uh, legal finance operations listening uh, to this, I would urge you to join it. It's gonna be a wonderful journey. Christina? Yeah, no, that's, first of all, thank you for mentioning that property rights and the rule of law are foundational for capitalism. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> um, uh, you know, cl clearly, I mean, this is, it's fascinating uh, to hear how uh, this can help uh, combat things like in, in some of the big issues that we're all thinking about. Uh, you know, many people say now that um, the environment is the new economy and we need, to, you know, businesses, the relationship between business and government um, needs to really think about how to address that. And, so how, how can this market help us make sure that, you know, businesses are performing to their highest level? And where do, where does that part about the government, making sure that governments also are, um, uh, are functioning and performing in a way that makes sense? Is there a role for this kind of litigation in addressing issues? that uh, we see in government or where does that fall? I have an idea um, <clears throat> that um, I may have to play to that answer with a couple of remarks. Remark. You know, one thing that's curious to me is if, if you look at the history of um, the legislative permission for litigation finance, as I said, it was, uh, well, it was originally in Australia uh, didn't get as much uh, attention there as it did uh, when uh, the Courts and Legal Services Act uh, was, uh, uh, was enacted, as we say, in, in England in 2007. But here's the interesting part about it. It was that English legislation to permit lit litigation finance to solve what was believed to be a, a, a social problem, right, uh, access to justice, um, that... Um, that really led to the, the groundswell that became what this panel is describing, right? It was not so much the Australian phenomenon, although uh, a tip of the hat is, is, is needed. Uh, but, the, but the point is, what England did was to pass a law that was intended to do something. And what we did, the people on the panel, was to use it to do something else, okay? Uh, it was passed to permit consumer litigation finance. It did not, frankly, I'd love Leslie's input or others uh, with, with English experience, it was not meant to create a market for commercial litigation finance. Uh, it didn't contemplate it. 
Uh, and I don't think that the uh, parliamentary discussion really much paid attention to the fact that there could be this commercial, uh, this corporate B to B, if you if you will, instead of B to C um, investment uh, milieu that would that would arise. It was it was a fluke, almost. Um, and so the point maybe is one one about regulation, um, as Leslie pointed out. Uh, They've had self-regulation in the UK over commercial litigation finance. Seems to work fine. Uh, no black eyes, no uh, parade of horribles. In the US, there, there is no regulation. Um, I think regulators realize that if they want to start regulating it, they've got to regulate the 125-year-old phenomenon of contingent fees. And obviously, lawyers in legislatures are not going to let that happen. Uh, so, so right now, the world of commercial litigation finance is, is navigating some pretty broad markers uh, in the, you know, in the sea uh, that, um, that uh, are basically, un, uh, you know, unimpeded. Uh, should there be regulation, one might ask? Um, that goes back to the, maybe to the Chamber of Commerce debate. I, I personally believe there are uh, rational reasons to regulate consumer litigation finance. Um, but the problem is that litigation finance gets lumped all together. And so what DuPont is doing with Exxon uh, could be swept into regulation when, when in fact it doesn't deserve to be. It's, it should operate in a completely free market environment. Uh, so that's important to watch as you look at the reg regulatory landscape. You know, it was focused on consumer. There is still some drive to regulate consumer finance. I think that's what the chamber's focus right now is on class actions, uh, mass torts and things of that nature, which again, is, is forms a very small part of the world that we live in, which is a very free market world, unlikely to be regulated, unlikely to be aided by any regulation, uh, but of course, advanced by, uh, by the transparency that uh, for example, the Burfords, the Omni Bridgeways, who are public companies, have brought about. Um, the, the bugaboo here, back to something Rebecca said uh, earlier, uh, there, you know, the industry is criticized. If, if there's one word that I think underscores it, it's, it's secrecy. Um, the, the industry is constantly accused of being secretive, opaque, non-transparent, all the words that one would expect not to hear about anything in the judicial system. Uh, that's maybe particularly relevant this week, in fact, in the United States. Uh, but secrecy has been an issue. But, you know, I would say back to those who think there's not enough transparency in the way um, uh, matters are funded, how fundings are, are structured and things of that nature, is remember what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with an asset, right? And I think everyone on the panel would, would sort of nod at the idea that yes, we, we, we invest in assets. Uh, they are claims, interesting claims, um, not interested in law firms in the US yet, but you can buy a law firm in, in England if you want to now. They're still very different across, uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, but the, um, uh, the, the, the point is, remember that what we are investing in has to do with the litigation. And if the fact of our invest, investment or if the nature of our investment were known to the other side, then that creates an imbalance, uh, an inequality of arms, if you will. And, and so there is a reason uh, to be somewhat secretive, uh, Rebecca, um, I think you might agree. But, but we can't take it too far because then we're criticized for being secretive. Yeah, if I may, I, I agree with everything you've said, Tim. And I, I think there are two points that are sort of worth stating despite the fact that they're incredibly obvious. And that is, it plays right into the capitalism theme, which is the purpose of litigation finance is to make money. And it, I mean, Right, we all already know that. But first of all, who's going to invest in a case if they don't actually think it's meritorious and will ultimately make money? I mean, that's just the fundamental basis of this entire industry. So it's such a horrible argument, going back to Leslie's point, 
that, you know, this kind of financing is going to encourage frivolous lawsuits. The whole point of the, of the, of the industry is to not invest in frivolous lawsuits, but to invest in lawsuits that have some kind of merit that will ultimately justify a return. So that's number one. And number two, I couldn't agree with Tim Moore that, you know, secrecy is, is one thing, right? It's hard to get into this market, which is why people need to hire me. <laughs> but but it's, it's for a purpose. I mean, it, private companies do not have to publicize how they are capitalized. That is the rule of law right now. And it's the same thing. I mean, this is I, what I'm seeing generally is sort of originally this this industry was sort of for litigators by litigators, right? I mean, that's how it started. You have to be able to understand the merit of a case in order to decide whether or not it's a winner or a loser. But what has happened is the financial markets have taken a hold of this because it's really about money. And it is just another type of asset that can be capitalized and monetized. And so absolutely litigators are essential to kind of advise whether or not each particular matter individually and then as a portfolio if we're talking about sort of bigger matters is is meritorious and is going to be a winner but the reality is it's the same thing as capitalizing you know your your sheep farm i mean it, it's the it's using an asset that a company has and and get, making money off of it. I mean, it is the essential definition of capitalism. So, you know, I do agree that there isn't a need to regulate on a broader scale. And, and of course, keep in mind, you know, a lot of these firms that are not publicly listed are private equity funds. And, and there's regulation in private equity. I mean, it's not like much people can you know, take your money and just go spend it anywhere. There are fiduciary obligations, there are SEC regulations. I mean, it's unregulated specifically, but we're in a capital market system that is highly regulated. So, you know, it fits into that kind of kind of um, fold. And, and I think it's, it's, we're remiss in saying it's completely unregulated because we're in a system that is regulated. I agree completely with that, Rebecca, because we're we're not directly regulated by a specific government agency, you know, at you know, qua litigation funding, but we're litigate we're regulated when we're in courts. A judge oversees litigation. Um, and so, you know, any time that the chamber complains that you know we're not transparent enough, you know, point to all the cases where disclosure of funding was found to be relevant to the case. There's not a lot of them because it's generally not relevant, but the judge has power to cause litigation funding agreements to be disclosed in the proper circumstances. What the what the chamber wants is complete open kimono. Let us look at your strategy and, and what's behind, you know, what's behind your books so that we can better uh, lodge defense against your, you know, your, your uh, counterparty's claims. That's not the way the legal system works. Unfortunately, we have work product protection. We have rules in place so that it is a even playing field for both sides. Um, but, uh, you know, agree completely that it is, it is not uh, completely unregulated. It's just not regulated in the way that um, I think the chamber would want it to be regulated in a way that would shut down the industry so that they wouldn't have to worry about us anymore. The judge is a regulator in many cases. Right. Because the judge, if the judge says, I want to see the funding agreement, what do you say? Well, so we, <laughs> if the judge if the judge is convinced that the rel that the funding agreement is relevant and and discoverable, it's not otherwise covered by work product in whatever circumstance, then we produce it. That's you know we follow the rules because we are operating within the rules. We need the legal system to be functioning properly, and we have to obey those rules. Um, it is it is simply that in a general matter, as a general matter, litigation funding is not relevant to the case. What does it matter if you are being funded by your uncle Joe or a litigation funder? It doesn't. Have any relevance to the claim you're making against the defendant? Um, that's that is a key point that I think the chamber elides frequently. Or, or even more broadly than that, Andrew, like a company that's taking on operating cash from Citibank and yep. otherwise moving the money, right? Money is is fungible, right? Moving the money to pay for the to pay for the lawsuit. I mean, does that does that constitute third party funding? I, if, if I mean. Under some really broad interpretations, yeah, it would. And there's actually questions about, you know, well, um, you know, some of the, the disclosure rules in, in a few of the federal courts are very broad. You know, any interest in, in a claim. Well, does that mean that my recourse finance agreement with Citibank 
um, must be disclosed? And I think the answer to that is generally no. We don't want to disclose that because that's not what that's not the point of the disclosure rules. The existing disclosure rules are exist to prevent conflict, judicial conflicts. Um, there's no rule that requires disclosure so the defendant can know what's going on behind the plaintiff's back. Like that's just it's not part of the game. I might, I might throw something else out that, that's a, sort of a navigation point in the sea we move through. Um, you know, we think about things like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are talking about sort of business to business style litigations. But, you know, all businesses are not created equal, um, nor at the same time. Um, there are the small businesses, of course, that have been injured by the conduct of big business. Um, and uh, often they don't have the resources of the big business uh, that would permit them a, a running chance at actually uh, bringing a claim successfully. And so, you know, you could put, a, put almost a label on uh, the chamber's initiative. It's the chamber of big business commerce and not the chamber of commerce, all right? Now they do have members that are small and often it is those businesses that simply cannot afford a very high cost of litigation in, in, in England or the US or international arbitration that have to have access to this. So uh, I, I guess I'll say, you know, I've dismissed access to justice as really more a consumer phenomenon, but it does exist in the business world as well. I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to just restrict it to access to justice because I think we are going to find the next iteration of litigation finance is really going to be just about uh, capital provision to to large businesses. I mean, certainly for Burford, that is a major area of expansion for us. You know, there are businesses, large businesses, Fortune 100 companies that have tons of litigation or potential litigation on their books. They have no way to monetize those assets. They simply sit on the books and they're generally not valued at all. The, the provision of litigation capital can unlock available capital they didn't know existed. Um, and that's especially true, you know, in the world of huge antitrust actions that you know every every business is is a part of um, there are huge claims out there that, that businesses have and are learning that they have that they just never really paid attention to before um, so it's not just the small businesses it's also the the large businesses um, that are are starting to to realize okay well this is just our normal capital management uh, just providing litigation funding versus monetizing any other receivables or other assets we have here's another bit of capitalism perhaps um, companies have balance sheets where they are permitted to or forced to include contingent liabilities. They, they can't, they're, they're forced not to include contingent assets, which is what a litigation claim commonly is. Then on the profit and loss account side, they have to pay their lawyers. And there's this drip, drip, drip of funds leaving the PL account constantly and at an increasing pace because law is not getting any cheaper, guys. And the, the sorts of interventions that Andrew is talking about take a, a, a company's in-house legal department, if you like, off balance sheet. It's like a friendly off balance sheet receivership where they they don't have any drip 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 in the PL anymore because the funder is paying for the costs. Even sometimes the funder can realize proceeds from judgments that have not yet been executed. So that the the company can put things that have derived from a contingent asset into the balance sheet as a realized asset. And it's a, it's a sort of magic wand thing, but utterly regular, utterly set out as the way things have to be done by um, a, a corporate regulation. And, and, and legal finance is the key to opening all that value and shutting down all that leakage. I might underscore here <clears throat> uh, a certain fact, as regular as it all is, we, we believe, um, I mean, if a chief financial officer of a major company 
uh, has the latitude to deal with a foreign exchange problem in, in a transaction uh, and to do that with forward contracts or whatever the device is, shouldn't that same CFO be able to monetize a different kind of asset uh, like a litigation claim? I mean, it, it's simply a tool that should, that, that, that should be available, um, I think. Uh, and it does serve a number of different purposes across the entire spectrum uh, of, uh, of business and, and law. Yeah, and that, that, that comment, does, you know, it doesn't uh, only apply to corporations. I was contacted in the last month or so by a gentleman who was the former uh, counsel for the city of Evanston, and his whole idea is we need to take this to the public sector entities. And so he, he's trying to raise a fund right now to really provide litigation funding to uh, private sector entity organizations. And, and applied in the private sector. I thought, I thought, you know, I think there's a whole other host of <laughs> issues and risks and uh, considerations there, but I thought that was an interesting uh, angle as well. Yeah, it is. I mean, and in what, fact, I'm sorry, Leslie, go ahead. I was just gonna say, and what, what is the corresponding thing that investors get out of investing in litigation funding? And the key thing that they always mention is, that the returns from litigation funding are non-correlated. They don't relate to any other um, performance of any other standard type investment. So the stock market can collapse, litigation funding is unaffected. Uh, interest rates can treble. I'm pretty sure litigation funding wouldn't be <laughs> affected. And, and that, that stability is something that, because litigation funding, when it's successful, also has reasonably high returns. That is something that investors love to have in their portfolio. It's not the only thing they want to have, but they want to have a piece of it because it takes care of uh, their new alternatives fund. It's a good place to put their money. So there's benefit for investors, benefit for the people who are being invested in, and what's not to like. Tim, you were about to make a comment. Well, I, I'm just reminded yet again of something that, that could be lost on the non-lawyer. Um, these are legal assets. That seems to be kind of the growing uh, moniker for, for this wider industry. I mean, it was alternative litigation finance in England. It was litigation funding in the beginning. And these terms have kind of morphed a little bit, but now it seems like the broadest term is, you know, legal assets or legal claims. However, you characterize it, uh, they they are very complex. They're esoteric. Um, they are understood principally by lawyers. I think that's changing. I think that the the shape, risk, bankability, investability of uh, of claims now is is uh, in, in part departing from being the exclusive domain of, of lawyers. This is a point Rebecca made. Um, finance people are coming into this business <clears throat> and doing perfectly well. And in fact, adding uh, a dimension to, to the industry that it, that it sorely needs. Um, but, th but they are complex, risky investments. Why are they risky? Are they risky because they're bad? No, they're risky simply because you don't know how a case will come out. You just, there's no way of knowing, right? And, and it does have to do with things like what the judge ate for, ate for breakfast in the morning, uh, whether he got in a fight with his wife or husband last night. I mean, these are issues that still go into this very strange sausage called the law. Um, so it takes special specialists uh, to approach the market, to be in the market. Um, uh, so yeah, complexity is really the point I wanted to make very difficult assets. And if I may just add one thing, I completely agree with you, Tim. I also want to just say, in sort of the, the biosphere of litigation finance, there's, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of new players coming in to sort of supplement the skills of the lawyers and the funders. Like, for example, there's a lot of AI happening 
in the legal industry in general, but now people are, are paying for it using litigation finance. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of different ways to evaluate the merits of these claims. I also know about non, you know, lawyers who are not funders and they are not working as law firms. So, they, so not providing legal advice, but actually valuing cases. So evaluating the case and the merits of the case and sort of providing a value estimate. Um, listen, we can talk about whether this is valid or not valid or useful or not useful, but the reality is it's happening. There are supplemental players popping up to sort of perform all these services, you know, in an effort to kind of limit the risk that's, you know, separate, a little bit separate and apart from the legal analysis of the underlying cases. So Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Andrew, please go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, I, I, Rebecca's exactly right. I mean, traditionally, lawyers are good at, litigators are good at litigating their cases. They are, they've been less good at saying, well, it doesn't make financial sense for you to continue paying me, um, so stop. Um, that's a hard thing for a law firm to say. Um, and so, yeah, there, there is a place, I mean, litigation funding can serve that, that purpose by refusing to fund a case that is not, you know, not economically viable. Um, but yeah, the, the consulting industry here is growing. The AI, uh, I, I will admit as an underwriter, uh, I have some doubts at the ability of, of an AI to properly underwrite a case. Um, but uh, certainly that is, is part of the overall ecosystem that is, that is developing. You know, Andrew, one might argue that it's almost impossible over the last 30, 35 years for a lawyer to say, eh, it's time for you to stop funding me. It doesn't make economic sense. St since Stephen Brill came along and, you know, we've got the AMLA 100 and the profits per partner and the revenue per, per partner, I think we now have uh, baseball trading cards of lawyers. And, uh, you know, so in some ways you provide this uh, an oversight in terms of what's uh, economically viable and an important voice for for the client. So with that, we only have about six minutes left in our program uh, before we turn it over to Christina to close. So I thought maybe we could start, Rebecca, with you and a couple of closing thoughts, and then we'll work our way around the room. Sure. I guess what I would just say is this market you know, I really think is here to stay. And I think it's for the benefit of, you know, justice. It's for the benefit of people um, who are, you know, have been wronged. And I, and I like, I like that because I like the idea of working and sort of wearing a white hat, but I, but I genuinely believe that that is true. Um, I do think it's evolving and I do think it's shifting and I don't think it's going to look the same in five years as it looks now, um, just as though it didn't, doesn't look the same now as it does did five years ago. Um, I think we're going to see bigger money, more portfolios, um, because that inherently kind of reduces the binary risk that um, Andrew was talking about earlier. Um, but I do, I do think that this industry is here to stay and, you know, and I say this with Leslie in mind, like bring on, bring on the, the issues because I think we're going to be able to solve all of them over time as we sort of show the market that this is a viable asset class um, for investors to make money and for companies and, and individuals to get justice. Rebecca, before I turn it over to Ed for his closing thoughts, I just want to say you used a term that perhaps some of our listeners won't be familiar with in these cynical times. I think that word was justice. So we, we may need to explain that to everyone. Um, Ed? Yeah, um, listen, I'm really excited. I think we're at a really interesting point in time uh, from the perspective of, if you look at the confluence of uh, the legal industry, finance as it relates to the legal industry, insurance, and ultimately private equity. Uh, you know, I think the recent uh, decision by Arizona to allow third party equity into law firms, I think that's going to be the th uh, sort of thin edge of the wedge. And, and I think other states will have no uh, um, uh, alternative but to, to get on board. And, and that, I think, is going to be a real change, at least in the U.S. marketplace. Uh, and we can learn a lot from what happened in the UK and, and Australia because they've, they've allowed that to happen. But I, I think it's going to create a, a very different environment of competition, co-opetition, um, innovation, uh, new products uh, coming out from all different angles, people working with one another to try and solve solutions. So 
I, I think the next 10, 20 years will be really interesting in this, in this area. Ed, thanks so much. Leslie? Well, um, the International Legal Finance Association is a trade association, not a regulator, but we do feel that we can't do anything unless we have an idea of what best practice looks like. So I'll finish, if I may, just on best practice. The agreements need to be clear. They don't need to be too difficult. That duties to the court must be respected. Funders have to be very acutely aware of conflicts of interest and to avoid them at all costs. They must also preserve confidential information and preserve privilege, all forms of litigation privilege. And they have to have enough money. There's no use making a promise about funding a case if you're gonna run out of money halfway through. So these are the questions that people going to a funder ought to be primed to ask. Andrew? Uh, I think I, I will probably echo a lot of what Rebecca said in that um, you know, the industry will continue involve, to evolve. Um, there's, there's so much demand from the litigants um, for capital, from law firms for capital. This industry is not gonna go away um, because there's an economic need. Um, as you know, precept of capitalism, if there is an economic need, someone will arrive to provide the service that uh, is needed. Um, and so we, you know, we're here now. What we look like in five years, um, you know, what what will the cases be? What you know, what's coming out of this economic crisis that will turn into the, the big litigation of the next five to ten years? Um, I think we'll discover that as we move along. But you know, that has traditionally been uh, what we do. So um, you know, stay tuned and uh, you know, hang on for the ride. And Tim, I'm happy to say that we can bring in the ghost of Mark Twain, who said about when he looked upon his old own aging that Haley's Comet brought us in and Haley's Comet will take me out. And so you brought us in, please take us out. <laughs> uh, I'm glad that wasn't a comment on my age. You know, I, I think it's very interesting to, to, to think, um, you know, muse about what the future looks like, but, but to maybe paint a little bit of a picture of it. Um, I think AI is going to very much change this industry. You cannot underwrite a case that is uh, figure out how a case is going to come out with currently known artificial intelligence, but it's going to start to play a, a much bigger role. It's going to make the industry more efficient. I personally think that the industry is going to, to, to aid the development of, of AI research in uh, inside the litigation area, uh, which is gonna make changes. And that all flows right alongside the entire devolution of uh, the legal uh, process system. Uh, legal process outsource um, organizations are springing up every day. The notion of old law and how it did things, uh, it's being dismantled. It's being uh, taken into silos and those are becoming independent businesses in and of themselves. So as this disaggregation happens, uh, I think litigation funding is just one uh, very central silo uh, in, uh, in the law. That is, how is, is, is law financed? Um, you cannot underestimate the potential in the future, particularly as oh, yeah. insurance comes into these markets, um, how, um, uh, how defense side funding uh, can evolve. Uh, in other words, this is not just going to be a plaintiff's phenomenon. It will be a defendant's phenomenon. I think insurance is the reason that it hasn't gone that way because insurance is the right financial tool to access the defense, uh, the defense side. And so, you know, where, where do you end up? I think you end up with rationality. I think you end up with fewer disputes. I think disputes get worked out faster. If there's a trader on the defense side and a trader on the plaintiff side, why can't they sit down and work out a simple financial economic principle? They don't have to go through a lot of litigation to do it. That's not gonna work in divorce, okay? But it will work in large antitrust contract, uh, state taking cases and so forth. I think it will actually reduce the amount of spurious litigation uh, in the end. Tim, uh, thank you so much. And let me thank the panel in advance and turn it over to Christina, who as always, it's so great working with you. 
Thanks, Richard. Thank you all. This has been fascinating. Uh, just helping us think through how this kind of litigation funding can actually make capitalism work better by having innovation in the market system, making sure that bad actors, there's a recourse against bad actors and uh, contributing uh, even to social justice issues, um, you know, is, is something that I think it's it's really interesting for us all to think about. Um, besides just spurring a new market, creating new jobs, and creating a, a lot of uh, a lot of interesting directions for the future of our economy and you know other places in the world too. So, thank you so much. It's been fascinating. Um, as we close this panel season, uh, series of panels for this uh, fall season. Um, thank you all for joining us for them. Uh, we will be back in the spring with a new series. We will be posting information about those on the uh, website. So please uh, do take a look at that. And uh, we wish everyone a, a happy end of the year, happy and healthy end of the year. And once again, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Okay.